in with a warm smile to someone. Thank you. We'll start this third day, day three, 17th day of November 2023. While I call this meeting to order, please let's settle down, let's sit down, let's come in so that we can start as scheduled. The final keynote address will be given by Professor David Mills, um, Pedagogy and the Social Sciences, University of Oxford. Please give him a round of applause while he comes here. And I'm glad to say that the Secretary General of Arua is already seated. And so please, a round of applause, Professor Ernest Ayete, Arua Secretary General. I hand over to you, Professor. For those who had put down their names for the tour to the museum, it's between 10 and 1.30 today. And please, let's just meet out by the door so that we can take off from there. Thank you very much.
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to encourage you to take your seats so that uh, we can start. Before introducing the speaker for this morning, I'd like to apologize for a mistake in the uh, schedule for today. And uh, so if you turn to the program, you will notice that uh, we are not ending the day sessions until 7 o'clock, which was not intended. My attention was drawn to it in the bus here when I, I overheard a conversation between two ladies. So um, the mistake starts from the, um, the five parallel sessions starting at 2.30 will be ending at four, not uh, five. The, the parallel sessions will end at uh, four. And then we take a break from four to 4.30 and then begin the policy round table at 4.30. And so we will be ending at six and not at seven. I hope you get it. Yes. So, so those who want to go shopping can go shopping after six. <laughs> I have heard those two ladies because they were talking about shopping. <laughs> <laughs> Good. So we'll be closing at six and uh, not at seven. Thank you very much for that. So today we are starting our final day and we've started it with a, a final keynote address. And uh, we have Professor David Mills from the University of Oxford who will be talking to us about uh, refiguring Africa's research and public publishing infrastructures from a citation economy to knowledge ecosystems. You know, uh, David comes from Oxford with a very rich uh, pedigree uh, in, in the area of education. He is in the Department of uh, Education and uh, Vice President of Kellogg College and Deputy Director of the Center for Global Higher Education. From what I've seen of him uh, and come to read about him, he's done a lot of work on African universities. Uh, he's, he knows quite well the Ghanaian scene. Um, I've been studied it, and I'm sure he'll be telling us about it in his own ways. So, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Professor David Mills to speak to us. As, as you can tell, there's no uh, plenary session that will follow his. So he'll speak for 30 minutes, and then we'll have 30 minutes for discussion where you can ask questions and make comments for 30 minutes. Thank you. Lovely. Great, thank you. Ekaro, Molo, Nangadef. Bonjour, Jambo. Good morning. How are you all? It's lovely to be here. Um, it's a real honor. Um, I'm a, an Arua fresher, but, but I'm hoping I, I can stay with the course because I'm enjoying it very much. I, I, the keynote has a nice chance to thank everyone behind the scenes who makes these conferences work so well. So, I want to thank a group of people who haven't perhaps been thanked already. Quite apart from the organizing team of Stella, um, Abigail, Emmanuels, uh, Mohammed, but all the cleaners, the, the cooks, the drivers, the guards, um, everyone has looked after us so well. Thank you very, very much. So I have a hard task today. There's been so much wonderful conversation over the last few days, we've learned so much. We've re reflected on the need to be somehow both global and local at the same time. 
to build transnational academic solidarity, to cope with a deeply divided world, to try and deal with the unfair and extractive relationships between Global North and Global South universities, to cope with AI and to think about digital and how it's going to transform all our worlds, and to remind ourselves of the contract between universities and society. So now what, do I, what can I add? Should, should I leave you with a nice, optimistic, upbeat end note? Or should we be pessimistic about all the challenges? <clears throat> and I'm very aware that today we have lots of um, ECRs and clusters who need to be inspired as they develop their, their research agendas. So, I'm going to give you a riddle to get us going, and then I'm going to give you a story. So here's my riddle. What does this South African bird have to do with our lives as researchers, as policy makers, as research students? Hands up. <laughs> it's an outstanding navigator. It builds very large nests. Accumulate stuff, okay, so that's a good try. Good, good, yeah, thank you for trying. I'm going to give you some more clues. This bird lives in our libraries, but it's very hard to get into. It's very expensive, and it produces a lot of numbers. Anyone, anyone want to guess? Uh, you're not going to get it, I promise you. Sorry, this is, I shouldn't set a riddle you can't solve, should I? Or perhaps that's the point of riddles. Sorry? Citations. Citations. You're getting close. Now, what's the connection? Publications? Books? Yeah, yeah. No, okay. So, yeah, 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 this is a really interesting riddle. And the, the riddle is that when El Sevier were dreaming up their new citation index, they went for a walk in the woods. I don't know whether they were South African woods, but they, they came across this bird. It's, a, it's called Hammercop. It's, a, it's an endangered South African bird. And it's such a rare type of bird, it builds nests a meter and a half wide. And um, it has its own genus. So the Latin name for this bird is Scopus umbretta. Okay, so this is Scopus. It's a South African bird that African scholars can't publish in. Okay, uh, and so, <laughs> so, so, so this, is my, this is my story that I want to tell you today. A story about how this, how this nest got built, um, how this bird has colonized our universities, and perhaps our minds too. It's a story that's intriguing and a bit shocking. It's a story that makes me a bit angry. I'm going to have some numbers for you. Those of you who like numbers, I'm going to have some pictures and even a few treats. So sit back and let the story begin. OK. so. The story has to start with the growth of science, okay? 19th century, or perhaps we go back to the first ever journal that was published by the Royal Society in 1760 or something like that. Before, before the first journal was published, um, scholars wrote to each other, okay? There was a republic of letters where ideas got shared and passed around. And then gradually, the idea of a journal got created and um, there's a lovely history of the journal by um, someone called Cesar. And in the 19th century, suddenly, the journal as a model for, for communicating ideas takes off. So there were probably about 100 journals at the start of the 19th century, and almost 10,000 by the end. So this is a log graph, those of you who, know, who, know, who are interested in these things. So there's an exponential growth, OK? We're, ever since the start of um, publishing, of research, we've seen a, a constant exponential growth in, um, in the numbers of journals being published. And if you look at the, the, the rough averages, it, it, sort of gets, it sort of increases after the war. There's a 5% after the war. So I want to talk a little bit about what happened after the war, Second World War, 1945. It was clear that um, science played a huge role in um, the Allied victory, radar, um, <laughs> the nuclear bomb. Um, and so at that point, the American government really ramped up its funding for science. Um, and there was a sort of a, a, a settlement that created a whole um, 
fund for, for, for basic research. And so you see after the war a number of, um, of massive um, projects and, and journals getting going. So the problem then, if you have this, um, and I, I would also add that you know, there are many African journals that were started in the 50s and 60s as well. Those of you who, who know the history of, of Ibadan will know that you know, very early on, journals were being published from um, all the, brand, the new post-colonial universities. Black Orpheus was a really important literary journal being published from Ibadan. Transition from um, Makera in the 60s. So it, there was a, you know, a global sort of enthusiasm for sharing knowledge through journals and through um, publication. The problem comes, how do you handle this information? How do you handle the, uh, the, the enormous amount of, of, of sort of different publications? How do you keep up with it? Now, it, it might be easy for us now, we go and do a search on Google Scholar or um, on Scopus, but, but back after the 1950s, it was very hard. So this guy here is called Eugene Garfield, okay? He was, he was an American um, chemist by training who got very interested in how to make science management more efficient. And he styled himself as an information scientist. And he came up with this really clever idea that if he um, photocopied all the contents pages of all the journals that, were, that, that he thought mattered and stapled them together, and he had a printer in his hen house, a cyclist style printer, he, he, he printed out on airmail paper a sort of stapled together pamphlet of all the contents pages, and then he'd mail it out to anyone who wanted to subscribe. And this was called current contents. And this is the way in which, if you were a hard-pressed researcher, I think it started in chemistry, but that's the way you kept up. You, could, you received this, and you could read it, and you could even send off this little envelope. I don't know if you can see, but it, it says, request the print. So that's how you found out what was happening. You, you got hold of this, this little pamphlet, you read it, you saw what, the, what topics were in there, and you requested a copy of the paper. This idea made him money, okay? And very quickly he expanded from one current contents to many, many, and um, he set up a, a, a business called the Information, Institute for Scientific Information. But he wasn't prepared to stop there. He had an even bigger idea. What he thought if one created a citation index. So no longer thinking about how we index, if you think about a book index, it's alphabetical, it links to concepts, but an index that links citations. It was a hugely ambitious thing to do because he had very basic computing power. He had to enter all this, he, he, he recruited a whole team of people who were going to enter data um, on um, all the citations in journals onto a magnetic tape, and then it was all uploaded. I mean, you, know, you can imagine the complexities of this. It was a hugely sort of, it's almost crazy idea, but, but um, we'll, we'll see where the story ends. So, that, so he experiments with this with three journals, and he, he realizes that he can, he can do it. And so then, in 1963, he comes up with the first ever citation index. And here are some copies from the Bodleian in Oxford. And if you look on the right, you can sort of see how it works, that each um, article has, um, has notes of the number of times it's been cited, okay? So once you develop this index, then you can trace, and, and he wasn't really interested in making money. In fact, this almost bankrupted him. The, the project was so impossibly large, he, he really couldn't do it. But, but the idea was that he would, um, he would be able to create a, a way of tracing how knowledge develops and where it comes from. And he starts in 1963 with the first index. And this is important because I want you to look very carefully at where and which journals from which countries were indexed, okay? This is really important. He's based in America. He's been selling to um, the sciences current contents. He, he knows where his commercial market is, so he decides he's gonna focus on American journals primarily and European journals. How many journals in that list there are published from outside Europe or America? There's a, a couple from Japan and a few from India. Okay, that's it. So this is, obviously this is, his, this is the first index, the first citation index. And he's, he's justifying this by saying, well, actually, you only need to, he comes up with this, this inverse square law called um, Brad, Bradford's law of scattering, that most of the most important research is in a few journals. So he says, therefore, we don't need to, we don't need to index too many journals. Let's just index the most important ones. 
Now, who's going to define which are the most important ones? Well, perhaps the commercial market might help, perhaps sciences, perhaps America might guide you. Um, <clears throat> It can't, so, so, it, so he says, well, we, don't, we only need to index a thousand journals. The evidence is that that's enough. Now, of course, very quickly, every journal that isn't in there decides they want to be in there and lobbies him. So the numbers increase very fast. Um, and you can see the numbers go up. And now it has about 22,000 journals. But still, 80% are published in or from Europe or America. Uh, one more little, little snippet here. Anyone know who this person on the right is? It's Robert Maxwell, okay? So the other in little sort of storyline here, those of you who will have heard of Ghislaine Maxwell will know this is Robert, he's his father. He was similarly entrepreneurial. He tried to buy Garfield's index and failed. But he set up a very influential publisher called Pergamon. And at the same time as science was expanding, he could see there was a huge market for selling academics their own ideas. Okay, and so he, ex he, he bought a few journals when he was in Berlin. He was a, a double agent for the British and the, and the Russians and was very well connected. And he, so he came back, set up his business in Oxford, in Headington Hall, and created a global empire which made an awful lot of money out of selling subscriptions to universities. And he was convinced that you could launch as many journals as you could, okay, because there was always a market for them, because universities would pay for them. Okay, so you have this situation where already there are lots and lots and lots of journals being published and money to be made. Now, this acceleration continues. This is the last 10 years, okay? In the last 10 years, this is a recent paper, even Elsevier has doubled the number of papers it's published. Well, not quite, you know, 300 to 500. Certainly MDPI, which is a sort of challenger journal, has um, hugely increased the number of papers it's published. So what we're seeing here is a, 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 you know, a system that is expanding and seems to be going ever faster. Um, and that's what I'm interested in. What does that mean for how we think about finding knowledge for reliable knowledge? What does it mean for African universities and researchers? Well, I want to suggest that we have, we're now living in a, what you might call a citation economy. Okay? Citations are the currency on which we can sell ourselves as researchers. They're the currency which um, journals trade in. Impact factor is all. They're the currency that universities want to get more of. So we have a system which, where the wheels and the cogs all turn together. And that creates so many problems. I, you, know, you could say it's going to explode at some point, and it is exploding in some ways. But I, but I think what I'm interested in is how do we get out of this? How do we solve this, this, this citation economy problem? And I would also note that some of these companies are becoming what you might call surveillance publishers. Elsevier is um, a data analytics, it styles itself as a data analytics company as much as anything. Now, now I want to turn and think about, right now, if you're an African journal editor, and some I'm sure of you are, how do you deal with this? How do you get into Scopus? How do you um, ensure your journal stays indexed? What are the implications of not being indexed? So this is a little slide showing some of the details about how um, Scopus selects journals. This is all on their website. It's all very public. They have a whole set of 24 criteria um, around you know, policy, how cited it is, um, how cited it is by journals already within Scopus. And then they have all sorts of um, data thresholds if you're, if you're self-citing too much, you're not allowed in. If, you are, um, if, you're, if you're not being cited enough, you're not allowed in. Okay? And they have to worry about this all the time because uh, they are constantly under, under sort of scrutiny about the quality of their journals. Um, and there have been a few mass retractions from these journals. So I've been writing a bit with um, a colleague in Canada, Tolawase Osubirado. And he's making an argument that we've written together that this is you know, deeply unfair that the, the board that selects these journals has very, very little representation from the global south. Okay? It's nearly all from Europe and America. And it, it needs to think much more about how it values and assesses research and journals from Africa. So if I go on and... and show you what happens if you're, not, if you, if you're delisted, if you're removed out of the journal. This is one, one journal that obviously was doing very well out of its listing, getting an awful lot of submissions, and then suddenly, bang, it's removed from the index, 
and slumps. So the index clearly is hugely important for journals and journal health. So this is, the, this is some data that I think is quite interesting. It's about the representation of African journals in the web of science. And what it's trying to do is look at, compared to a sort of comprehensive database of journals, which Ulrich's web is, it's an it's a, it's a attempt to be as, as you know, comprehensive as possible, how, how underrepresented or overrepresented are journals from different parts of the world in Scopus? So if you look on the left, there's 83,000 journals in the, the comprehensive database, okay? And of those, about 1,800 from Sub-Saharan Africa. And then you go across the bottom, bottom row, there are 147 of those journals are indexed in Scopus, okay? So, that's, so we're going to get into that and look at that a bit more carefully. But, that, but then we come up with some figures about how underrepresented compared to the overrepresentation of European journals this, that this data shows. Um, so r roughly, it's two, you're two thirds less likely to get in to um, Scopus if you're, a, if you're an African focused journal. So, uh, the quick commercial break. Um, this is our book. It's published open access with African Minds. And we do some talking to journals and journal editors in this book, um, and also to a lot of Ghanaian researchers. Um, and what, one of the things we were interested in, in understanding who counts, okay, who's doing the counting, who counts, is which journals from Africa are being included and where. So if, say, there are two and a half thousand, it's very hard to, to, to get the exact, exact number of active journals across sub-Saharan Africa. Then in Scopus, if there are only 150, 160 being indexed, then nearly 100 of those are from South Africa, which means that less than 50 from the rest of the continent are indexed. So what does that tell you about the ways in which scholarly knowledge and ecosystems from across sub-Saharan Africa are valued if um, so few are indexed? And um, what are the implications of that? And there's a nice quote at the bottom here from a Nigerian editor. We can't get indexed without international authors, but authors won't publish in a journal that isn't indexed. It's a chicken and egg. We can't get out of the loop. So what I guess I'm trying to say here is that Scopus doesn't really tell us much about the, the vibrancy and health of African research ecosystems. Okay? It tells us something about um, how a global science model values and assesses research, but it overlooks so much of what's important and what's happening across Africa. So this is an even more shocking um, page, and again, many of you will know more about this than me, so please help me with it. This is a list of Nigerian journals, sorry, <laughs> this is a list of journals that Niger Nigerian authors, Nigerian affiliated authors, publish in, okay? It's 10 years of the top 15 journals that Nigerian authors publish in um, that were Scopus indexed. So at the bottom, the total is 12,600 articles in these top 15 journals. But look how many have been discontinued from Scopus, okay? Now a couple of them are problematic journals, um, but many, many of them are long established um, Nigerian journals, some of you will perhaps can help me on this, but the African Journal of Medicine and Medical Sciences, published by University College Hospital. Um, there are um, West African Journal of Medicine. So Scopus is being tough, and it's discontinuing journals that aren't meeting their citation index data benchmarks. That's really tough. And what's then happening to those, to those citations? Somehow your knowledge is, is no longer valued. You, you, you feel, look at your journal, your, your publications, and say, well, you know, what, what, what do I make of this? Suddenly, I'm no longer, there's no longer a Scopus Index journal. Do I, do I carry on publishing there? Do I choose somewhere else? So, they, so the numbers are, are stuck. Half, half of the top 15 journals are no longer indexed and have been removed in the last 10 years. And this is a bit older research, but we know from um, Francois van Schalquick and Thomas Lucher that of African university presses, very, very few are active. The South African presses are obviously an exception, 
but many of them are, are just um, not publishing much or, um, or, or, or haven't published anything for a few years. So a couple of cartoons here. This is from um, Jimmy Spire Sentongo, um, who um, has been w working with me a bit, and he presented these, in a, in a, and he let me use them. Um, what are the implications of what you might call publish and perish? Okay, and so he, his, um, his, uh, uh, you know, the author wanting to get into an international journal. And um, Francis Naimanjo has a good quote here, saying that African authors often have to choose between relevance and recognition, or sacrifice recognition for relevance. Um, you have to cut your journal, your, your article, to fit into the editorial, the round, round um, circle for the square box in order to fit into the demands of um, European or American journals. And the last one here, of course, is how does this play out in terms of um, how your publications are judged um, by promotion boards? So um, here's another way we could do it. Instead of relying on um, Web of Science, we could map collaborations using something like Academia EDU. So the right-hand diagram is a web of science map of research collaborations around Africa. The left-hand one is one which shows citations and networks through EDU. It's much denser, it's richer, there's much more going on. Nigeria's in the middle. Um, and, um, and so this, this you know, is an example of if we could find other ways of, of measuring research collaborations and networks and publications, then we would definitely have a, a richer, more interesting, more dynamic picture. Why is South Africa so dominant? Well, I think many of you in South Africa will know all about some of these, some of these infrastructures. South Africa has you know, a, 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 a well-funded um, research infrastructure. It has a whole quality infrastructure as well, where there's a, a list of accredited journals that the Department of Higher Education and Training Debt publish every year. There's all sorts of evaluations of, of journal quality. And then there's a whole set of publishers um, and, and portals and um, university presses and independent presses, open access presses, all doing interesting things that, that flourish within this infrastructure. So, so in some ways, refiguring Africa's research ecosystems perhaps can take something from this model of a sort of rich infrastructure. But of course, the consequence of this is that this infrastructure dominates the region. And that means that research knowledge flows south, gets published by flowing south, and um, credits and money flow south as well. And so here's an example. If you want to be highly cited, it helps, A, to be South African, um, and if you look at the, the right-hand column, the right-hand table here, um, apart from the North African countries, South Africa totally dominates the number of highly cited researchers, um, and it also helps if you, you know, if you've been tra trained abroad. So it's a very distorted, it's a very um, unequal research economy, even within Sub-Saharan Africa. Okay, so so here's an example. Oh gosh. Um, of how I think we should be doing research and understanding particular challenges that a particular journal editor might face. So I've just taken this one example. Again, if there's someone in the room who can tell me more about this journal, that'd be lovely. It's called Nigeotech. It's a technology journal published by the University of Nigeria Press. Um, it was set up in 1975. It went online. It went open access in 2010. The editor is very dynamic. He um, worked really hard to build um, the credibility of the journal. He had to s convince reviewers to pay, um, to pay them in mobile phone dues. He's constantly struggling with power outages. So talking to him, it made me realize he, it's a 24-hour job being a journal editor. It's a hugely demanding role. Um, and, and even he said, look, after all this, look what happens when I speak to Scopus. When I tell them I'm from Europe, from Nigeria, those from Europe look at you twice, even if you're telling them the truth. Okay, so, so he, this uphill battle, it's a very unequal epistemic economy, it's a very unequal resource economy. But, here's the good news, I checked the journal website yesterday, and they were accredited last month in Scopus. Okay, so, so it's possible, it's possible to make it. And I think that's an example of just, you know, of how you have to, to be tactical, you have to work hard, you have to jump through the hoops that are being set by these, these commercial um, citation infrastructures 
and, and it can be done and it can be, it be done to Africa's benefit. So my last few slides then, trying to sum up, what, what's going on here? Well, um, I think Liz Landry, you talked about um, near areas, Africa must run while everyone else must walk. I do think there's a, there's, a, there's a problem here of acceleration. We're all having to go faster and faster to keep up. Those of you who are early career researchers in the room or postdocs will know what I mean when you, you're faced with producing ever more articles, there's ever more expectation on you, promotion criteria demand huge numbers. I mean, I, in, in our research in Ghana, we were looking at the numbers of papers you have to publish in order to get promotion to full professor. It's, so the demands on researchers are being metricized, they're being, they're being accelerated. But of course, this works for commercial publishing because um, th they can benefit, especially under a model of publishing that benefits from what they call APCs, article processing charges, okay? So um, more articles, more special issues, more journals, and, and we're feeding this by the expectations our institutions are placing on staff. I, and therefore, I think if you're at the edges of this, you have to run faster and faster. Hence the, the roundabout. I don't know if you, anyone knows what a roundabout is. You know, the, the sort of, um, you, you, know, you, you go faster and faster, and then you, you, you get flown off. Um, and, and at the same time, the indexes are so worried about f research integrity that they're making, it, they're making all sorts of, sort of AI tools that are expecting some sort of standard journal model. And we all know that journals are very different in their styles and their context and their, in, the, in the ways in which they work. So there isn't a standard journal that you can um, apply an AI learning tool to. Um, so how do we then move on? Is open access going to help us? Well, I would suggest that we need to be thoughtful about the type of open access we have. Those of you who may have heard of um, open journal systems, it's a software, open source, publicly available software system um, that anyone can use. It's a great resource for journal publishing. Um, but of the many journals, 34,000 journals that use it, only 4% are indexed in Scopus, okay? So there's many, many um, challenges in setting up an open access journal. And the current, what they call, gold model of open science, which is, does rely heavily on article processing charges, again, is exclusion, exclusionary. If you haven't got the resources, you haven't got the capacity to meet those often huge um, payment costs. So, so then we have to look to um, some possible policy hope, hope. UNESCO has a recommendation on open science that envisages an infrastructure organized and financed on a primarily not-for-profit and long-term vision. Now that's a big ask, okay? It's an interesting ask. It, it'll be a, a very challenging to see how this plays out, but, but I think people are beginning to realize that for a commercial company like Elsevier to both earn and make a lot of money out of publishing and to own the citation indexes that we pay to host in our universities, that bird has a very large nest, okay? Um, and so there's lots happening, I think, within um, the African research ecosystem that, that's hopeful and that we can learn from. But there are also lots of tools that we can now use. Those of you who are aware of OpenAlex, it's a huge open source um, journal database that look, potentially will offer an awful lot of different insights into, into the depth of research that's happening. And I think we should be starting to use those sorts of data sets. Um, there's all sorts of new open science platforms happening that are institutionally owned across Africa. So, so you know, keep an eye out, learn about, work out what's happening, and, and appreciate the journals that are doing really well, that are building, um, building reputation um, from within Africa. Um, so what would my advice be then in the last couple of minutes to um, policymakers, to universities? Well, I mean, I, I, what, who am I to give advice? All, all I can say is that um, I, what I see it both is scary, but also there are some potential um, green shoots. Um, the EU is really promoting a notion of more responsible research assessment, which is less driven by metrics. Um, they're trying to find new ways to value research excellence. Okay, we've heard so much about this, the contract of university with society. You know, 
metrics are not measuring that, are they? They're not measuring how we reach out and work with our communities. They're not measuring the impact we have when we teach. They're not measuring the impact we have when we send our, our students on, on sort of community projects. None of that is visible within a metric version of excellence. Um, I do think open science is the future, but it has to be sustainable. And I think that model is a model where yeah, libraries step up, universities step up, and cover the costs of publishing and, and strengthen what you might call sustainable open science. UNESCO has an open science toolkit that has lots of ideas. And I know my hat always goes off to people who, who edit journals. It's a labor of love and a real passion, but um, so important to support. And if I was an early career researcher, what advice would I give you? Well, what I did was I, I was tactical. I just published anywhere I could. Um, it's hard not to be tactical. But if you could be strategic, then you might want to learn about journals. How are they funded? Um, what, 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 I mean, beyond, beyond a sense of how do you judge them by their citations, what else is going on there? Are they places where you have, there's a good conversation and intellectual dialogue? That matters as much and perhaps more than its metrics. Um, we need to think really hard about what we do as researchers. It's not about publishing, it's about all the other forms of communication and dissemination that we can do, the types of work when we go out to schools or, or um, write blogs or appear in the media. Um, I've talked about uh, sustainable open science. I've said we need to support national journal ecosystems as well as international. Um, and remember, rankings will not be here forever. At some point we'll forget, we'll forget them. Another world is possible. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, David, uh, for drawing our attention to all the uh, gaps that we can find in the system, the result of uh, dwelling overly on the uh, citation index, and how, as a result of where we find ourselves resident, uh, we become disadvantaged. It's uh, very informative, very analytical. Uh, it, it allows us to also understand why within Africa itself there are big contrasts. So the more you invest in the infrastructure, the more you reap from it, as the South African experience will tell us. So let me now open the floor for any comments or questions. Adam. Thank you very much. I think that that was really particularly useful. Uh, the real question I have is a political one. And that is, I, I agree with the critique. Uh, I think 95% of the people in this room will recognize the critique. The question is, how do we go to this new world that you're talking about? And it seems to me that we have to start off from an understanding that the world is unequal. And the way you're going to change it is by using power and those that have power to make it in the interests uh, of, of, of the kinds of suggestions you're having. So, two recommendations. One, if we're serious about open science, it either has to be underwritten by a state structure. And frankly, the Nigerian state, or the South African state, or the Algerian state is too small a player. It's either the European Union, it's the Americans or the Chinese that could underwrite a global system that says, we will underwrite this, or it's a UN system that taxes the three big powers. But if you don't do that, you don't synchronize the alignment between researchers' natural inclination to progress and promote, be promoted, and the productivity and how you get impact. So you have to align that, and it's an underwritten, that's how you do it, that's the one mechanism. If that doesn't work, then it's the universities acting as a concert. But if the universities in Africa do it and the Americans continue to do what they're doing and the British continue to do what they're doing, the inequalities of our world will just make sure that people, that it doesn't work. So if the universities work, it's no use pleading with library managers 
because library managers get their budget from vice chancellors. And you might think that vice chancellors are powerful. It's the most impo impotent uh, job in the world because you, you think you have power until you realize you're constrained by money. And so the only way it works is by convincing the Europeans and the American universities to align with the African universities to do a collective buying operation that collectively underwrite the open, uh, the open uh, system that we are talking about. So it's either done by public money, the European Union, the Americans, or the Chinese, or you get the British and American and European universities doing it with the African, otherwise it's not going to work. And that's the dilemma we confront. How do you put pressure on British, American, and European universities to act in favor of a universal solution rather than pretend that they are universal? That it seems to me is the only solutions we confront. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. Uh, we'll take a few more and then, uh, yes, uh, Tim. Thank you for that great uh, presentation. Uh, I, I'm glad that uh, Japan features in this uh, uh, citation uh, issue. I just want to know, because we all, those of us here today, we know that uh, China is fastly becoming the global power. How big is this issue in the discourse in China? How big is this European, American dominated market of uh, citation and ranking? Is that an issue in China? Is there any lesson we can learn from China? Thank you. Russ? Yes, thank you, David, for an excellent presentation. I guess my question kind of aligns with what Adam had talked about, and that is, who is regulating this industry? It seems like no one is, and there's no accountability. This is why Elsevier and other uh, big platforms have a basic monopoly, um, and it's certainly not the academic institutions who are playing a role in this regulation. In fact, what we see is that you have vice chancellors, presidents of universities sitting on the board of Elsevier, so there's, you know, it, it, it's like these people are in bed with each other. And so how do we resolve that, that problem? It seems like there's a, a high degree of complicity uh, in this whole system, which makes it, I think, uh, inherently unfair, if not corrupt. Imran? Uh, that was great, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, but along the same lines of the previous question, I think what your kind of example of South Africa shows is that na national investments in these systems do work. I think the sad, sad thing about South Africa is that rather than making more investments in kind of our system and building it into Africa, in fact, what what our science system is doing is trying to integrate our system much more into the system that you uh, uh, that you critique so well. Any thoughts on how we can build in Africa uh, a kind of a, a, a kind of African universities uh, uh, a kind of high quality system? Because the trade-off really is that the more you you go kind of outside the global system, the, the more you have to confront the trade-off around quality. I mean, of the journals that you put up, I know one that was on the list that you could pay, you could pay $200 uh, uh, to and they would publish anything. So I think these, these kind of quality issues are, are, are part of the trade-off. And any thoughts on that? Thank you very much. Um, thank you for your presentation. Uh, 
I think there's a whole lot of political economy regarding um, publications and where some journals would charge up to £2,000, $2,000 for publications. And that actually is two months salary or three, four months salary of some professors in Africa. So it's, it's, it, it's inequalities and inequity. And I think we, together with Aru and other universities in Africa, we need to begin to define how we publish and where we publish. Because unless we are funded and we're continually glued to the global north, a lot of the, our publications will not be visible. And then again, the divide is getting wider and wider. We don't face the same problems. So if you want to address our societal challenges, we can't continue with this um, relationship that we have, which is actually death to African science. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. So my question is, what about unpacking where the reviewers come from? Because these journals cannot survive without a good reviewer base. How many of the reviewers for Elsevier are from Africa? So the question is, what power does the reviewer have to maybe break the monopoly? And as we all know, the reviewer doesn't really get financial comp compensation for the review. And also, to what extent does universities recognize this work that reviewers do, which you called the labor of love? Thank you. Thank you. Liz, I'll, I'll come to you in a minute. Let me get responses to all these. Things. I will start with you the next round. David. Well, if I could solve all these problems, um, it would be a happy day, wouldn't it? Um, <laughs> thank you all. Great questions. And um, I wish I was a policymaker sitting somewhere in the halls of, of Brussels, think, listening to this and thinking, ah, this is, this is my, my, my issue to solve. And I know that. Um, the EU is an interesting geopolitical actor. Um, Adam, you, you know, you, your question, your, your, your comment, it, it cuts the heart of it. You know, how, how do we transform an unfair world? Um, how, do we, how do we sort of, what, what influence can we have on geopolitics? And you know, universities are used as geopolitical actors, and they, and they do have some geopolitical power. But, but the current system is pretty hard to, to reform and refigure. But, but I think you know, all we can do, I think, is, is work together. And I think you know, where you said, OK, it's about universities acting in concert. It's about universities negotiating together. It's about African universities finding ways of, of, of common cause in those negotiations. Some of the negotiations with publishers have, have often been tough and bitter. But, it, but, it, but if it's just about shaving some money off the, the subscription fees, that's, that's not really serious, okay? So at the same time, you have to be thinking, okay, we've got to pay right now, but how in 20 years' time do we make, make institutional resources available? And so I was involved in a journal um, that flipped, okay? It had been, been with Wiley for 20 years, and, and we left Wiley. And the society that, uh, I'm an anthropologist, so um, it was an anthropology society, which is easy because anthropologists are nice and, nice and radical. So they were happy to, to take the, the financial hit. But it was a big financial hit because Wiley were, were giving us you know, a small share of their profits, but that was a big amount for our, for our society. So it is about thinking and preparing for how the economics of, of science would look different. Okay? It is about really investing in university presses. Again, I mean, and, you know, that's where... That's where we once were in Africa. There were amazingly strong university presses in the 60s and 70s. And, and you, know, you do see increasingly university presses moving to a, a model of open science that is, that is diamond. Okay? It's free for the researchers to publish in. Um, and that's because universities are backing it. So you're right, your budget is very limited. What power have you got? But again, if you can act in concert, if you can begin to look for examples, it's not going to happen all at once. It's going to be a 20-year thing. That, that, that's, that, that's my only sort of immediate response to this. Um, you asked about China. Yeah, China are very worried about it. And they had a, an initiative in the, in the mid-2010s mid to, to go outwards. And now they're saying, come back in again, OK? Because they can see that the, the system, the game, the playing field is built against them. 
And so certainly in the, in the social sciences and humanities, I mean, there's obviously also other political things going on here, but I think there's much more valuing now of publishing in Chinese journals and Chinese language journals. So there's a big political actor that is saying, actually, you know, we don't like this game either. Okay, and they have the power and they have to do so because universities are so defined by the part of the state, aren't they? So that, that, you know, the, the China example is both helpful and, and not helpful, but, but yes, great. Um, Russ, you asked about regulation. Yeah, I mean, is it? <laughs> um, um, I, think, I think it's really important to understand how we're captured as academics because you know, if you're on an editorial board of a journal, it's got prestige, it's got history, um, you're doing good work. Um, you know, you, you feel you're changing things as an editor, yeah? You feel you're bringing in more reviewers, that, that, that theme about reviewers from Africa, you feel like you're, you're changing who publishes. Um, so, so therefore you think, right, well, well, let's work from the inside. So probably that's why. So I think, it, you know, rather than saying, you know, well, I mean, it, clearly we're complicit. Clearly this is a system we've built and we're part of. Interestingly, when Robert Maxwell was in trouble for fraud, his biggest allies and supporters were his journal editors. Okay? They all stood up for him and said, you've supported us all the way through. So you know, that, that, that's interesting. You know, that, that he was absolutely committed to science and to making money. Okay? Um, you, you raised the question of, of South African um, um, investments and, and, and it, it, trying to integrate into the global. I, I agree with you. I think that's probably driven by a very metrics-based analysis of, of quality. Um, <clears throat> There are other ways of measuring good research. I mean, there are other databases out there, and I think perhaps one of the challenges is thinking, if we were to use a different set of measures or a different type of index, or building our own database, I know colleagues in Africa, in Canada, are trying to build a, a sort of a, an African index. Um, and I know that Codus Ria tried that for a long time. Um, perhaps that's the way to go, is you know, a bit like India has its own citation index, CLO, South Africa is in, I'm, I imagine, you know, they even though you're part of it, it is not used necessarily to judge researchers, but I, but I think it is possible to be both part of the global and really committed to national, national quality. I've written a lot about predatory publishing. Um, I don't like the word. I think it's very um, dehumanizing um, because um, there clearly are a whole spectrum of publishers doing very different things. You could argue that the charges that, that Elsevier are, are charging us you know, are predatory um, in their own way. Um, so. So, so I think the issue is, is definitely to think about quality, but perhaps not to come up with a list of baddies and goodies. I don't, I'm not sure that's helpful. Um, um, but but, but your, your, your question about inequity is, is you know, all the way through. Um, finally, reviewers. Where do reviewers come from? Yeah, I mean, I think that, 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 that sort of data will be really helpful to think about and for journals to collect and make, you know, for journals themselves to develop equity diversity strategies and, and to be pushed on diversity of editorial boards, diversity of advisory boards, um, monitoring where, journals, where, where reviewers and articles come from. I know, t I know Routledge, Taylor and Francis are doing some of this, um, and they publish a lot of African studies journals. But, you know, uh, they're still making a lot of money, and that money is flowing north. So, you know, it, it's a difficult balance. Anyway, thank you for those questions. Um, any more? Welcome. We still have time for the second round. So let's, and then, uh, excuse me. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. It, it seems to me that the situation is such that we need to work at different levels simultaneously. What Adam mentioned about who underwrites the movement into uh, an open system, I think it is very important, and I think that this is one area in which we need to work and we need to work together. Uh, uh, is this just one country press? It's not, it's not going to work. So that's the one, the one thing. But I think that the other level at which we can work, and we can work both individually and collective, is in the set of values that inform institutional cultures, that demand this. I mean, I have sat in countless promotions uh, uh, meetings at which we look at the impact index that the authors have. And, and that puts a pressure on the academic in order to do certain things and reproduces it. So 
we need to try and find a balance in, in, in moving that. So that's, for me, is, 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 is one point. I think that the other, the other element that we need to take into account is that there has to be a way of reimagining the financial models with which we internally fund research at our universities in order to do something in relation to publishing. And finally, and I go back to, 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 to the issue of the, of the model, if the model to which we are aspiring is a model that has been given to us, and this is what we are trying to emulate, evidently everything that we do is going to be to comply precisely with this because that's the way we get the kudos. So, so I, I just think that this is about, it's almost like a social movement <laughs> that we need to put together and, and, and all of us work, work together. That's my contribution. Thank you. Sisbe? Thank you very much. I do believe that there is immense value in taking a principled position. Uh, why participate in a system that does not speak to your own circumstances? Uh, we can blame everyone and ask anyone to contribute funding here and there. If you understand universities as there to serve the social purpose, haven't we been diverted from that important aspect? What would it take, for example, for African universities to say, thank you, but no thank you. We are not going to be party to a system which pulls us away from addressing some of the most urgent and pressing challenges of our continent, and that we will focus on what matters most to us. So, uh, yeah, for me, it's really a question of why participate? in a system and decry all the problems with it, and you very willingly participate in those. Just doesn't make sense to me. Thanks. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, uh, presenter. Uh, my question is, I think it's not a question straight, but I'm putting forward these to the Arua leadership, um, that I think we seem to have this problem of uh, not considering to having our own journals hosted by our own universities to get them as strong as the journals that we think they are very strong. We are speaking of submitting our papers to Elsevier. We are speaking of, we are thinking of, of submitting our papers to uh, uh, Springer and all these kind of journals, but we still have our own journals. And Arua never think about it. I have never seen Arua speaking about having our strongest journals, getting the, the scholars from Europe, America, submitting their papers to our journals. How do we think of actually making our journals as competitive as those journals we think they are strong, but we are having our journals down there? Why don't we think, as Arua, having our journals strong? And we speak about uh, indigenous knowledge. Some of the journals we submit in spring, they don't think of having that aspect of indigenous knowledge. They think of, you should remove this aspect, and then they publish that paper. But are we being competitive enough? What about five, six, ten years to come as Africa, strong in research and development? Thank you. Adam wants to come in again. And it's my apologies for coming in the second time. I know, I, I know this is uh, indulging me. I want to say two points, partly in response to what Imran said, but also in, in response to Sizwe, because I have a difference. You see, let me give you the example. I, when I am, became vice chancellor of, of, of WITS, one of the big things I tried to do is drive open science. And one of the most fascinating things is my Senate was my biggest opposition. I remember a professor in chemistry saying to me, 
It's all very nice to go open science. I want to be read by the professor in Princeton. Don't tell me I don't, because my reputation is dependent on that professor in Princeton for reading my article. And so you've got two strategies here. The one is Seizwe strategy, and in a little bit like or what Imran suggests, get the African system working. But here's the problem with the African system. However important we think it is, it's weak compared to the American system and the European system. It's in international relations, there were one group of scholars, called Arigi, uh, who suggested a delinking strategy from the global order. That's what Codestria tried. It failed. Because that is not going to work. We live in an unequal world. And yes, it's important, but you've got to recognize that individual academics are part of the global academy. They want to be recognized by their fellows. They want to be promoted. They want to be invited to Canada and London and Beijing to come and give lectures. And that influences their choices. The second way in international was a strategy that I think Tabo and Becky used. Is you enter the world order and you subvert it. You do a coup, if you like. That's the trick. Now the only way to do that is you need to find very strong partners. And there's only two partners you have. You either get shame the Europeans to do something, or the Brit uh, Chinese, or the Americans. You have to choose which one of them is more vulnerable to being shamed to doing it. That's the UN. That's the one thing. Or you have to shame the American universities and the European universities to act with us. This delinking strategy has been tried for 30 years. It failed. Principle is important, but principle pragmatism changes our world. That's what we have to do. We need to operate in a world of inequality and figure out what's our leverage to subvert it. That's the strategy, and that's what we're not thinking through. Rabbi. Um, thank you very much. Oh, I didn't call you. I called Rabbi behind you. Thank you very much. Um, I think, David, <clears throat> one of the things that perhaps maybe you've, you've addressed in, the, in some of the work you've done <clears throat> is that it's, it goes much deeper than where you are cited and, and, and where we associate our publications with. It's also who controls the knowledge. I know that a lot of African researchers, to get published in these journals, have to publish in Western or Global North uh, researchers whose research is being published, and who is setting the agenda for the research. So I think we can, we, we, the, the impact of, it's not simply where you publish, it's also the knowledge that is generated. Uh, if you do research on Africa, we are tr recently trying to get uh, research on foundational literacy and numeracy. And if you look at that literature, a lot of it is the agenda, the interest, is from the global north, is from Western uh, systems. And yet, if you come to Africa, there are a lot of interesting research that people are doing. We've seen some of them. But they are very hard to get published. They are good research, by the way. They are hard to publish. And some of what the African researchers are doing is, OK, then maybe we abandon that interest and associate with the interest of publishers in the, in the north. I get a lot of people who want to publish with me, not because they are interested in the, the main topic, but they know that by linking their work with me, work publishing outside, I, they get published. We have to disrupt that. And the, we, we, we had very good uh, university presses. Uh, 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 Ghana had a Ghana uh, university press. It was recognized. It was valued. I don't know what happened to it. We have to remember that the, our partners in the North if you want equity, they have to give something. And I don't believe they are ready and willing to give. No matter how hard we try, we have to have pride in what we do and begin to use some of the things we know has worked for us and to set the scene. If I'm in a university in, in Ghana and I, I say that you have to publish in, in a Western journal before you get your promotion, it's, you're not asking what are you publishing? Who owns the knowledge? Where does that knowledge come from? It's more important than saying you have to publish in a Western journal. And so I think we have to be brave enough 
and it may take a long time, but we have to take that initial step to make that commitment to our knowledge. And if the Western uh, journals don't want to publish, accept our knowledge, who is the knowledge for? Is it not for our society? And we will have to take a lot, we will take a hit in terms of uh, our credibility. Uh, uh, and if somebody wants to publish and be recognized somewhere else, that's fair enough. But we have to start somewhere and learn from the lessons that we can learn from others. Or else we are not going to make the, the progress. It's the same way in, in, in the universities we attend. If somebody goes to a university in, in, in the UK, I've seen students who have taken degrees abroad and their research is not any better than students who have taken degrees in Africa. I've seen, I see them all the time. But because they have that badge of the university, they are valued more. Why is that still continuing? I think we have to ask these fundamental questions. So we'll take a last one from the young man in the white shirt. And, uh, then yes, and thank you very well. much. If uh, I'd made my point uh, 15 minutes, 10 minutes ago, I would have been the first to say it. But I've had so far four people make it in the room. And I'm very excited that I'm starting to think like people who are wiser than me. Yes, I agree with one, two, three, four people that we attach too much. We, at, we wait to be validated by the Western stroke, the north of the globe. We at, the relevance of our research is attached too much to their validation. And I think that now we have reached a point where we have organizations like Arua. We are growing continentally enough to put down a foot and decide whether our research is valid or not by ourselves. And I think Arua is in a position to set about policies uh, that can guide on how we can make our own research relevant in terms of um, continental sharing of research, um, sharing of citations. Someone talked about why don't we cite our own authors, and I think Arua can guide on um, policies like these, such that we start doing something for ourselves and, st and stop depending on other established people in the better world. Thank you. Not better world, Thank the you. other yeah. world. Thank you. Thank you very much. David? So um, this conversation will, will, of course, run and run. Um, thank you all for some great thoughts. Many of you know much more about this than I do. And um, you know, we, we have to put our brains together and work hard on this and use all the resources. It's a social movement, as Liz puts it. I think that, that's, that, that's a good way of describing it. Um, trying to work at different levels, trying to think about the underpinning systems. I don't think journals are going to last forever. I think you know, we, we, the journal is a 19th century invention. It might not carry on. And we might increasingly think about breaking up our, our, our forms of knowledge. You know, perhaps blogs are just as important as ways of distilling and communicating. So that's one angle. I mean, Adam's points around we can't delink. Well, yes, I think um, probably it's both and rather than either or for, for me. I mean, it, the principal stands of, of roads in not, not joining rankings, that, 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 that's surely something to, to, to build on. Um, to sort of think about how one takes principal stands and be very pragmatic and operate, build those alliances. It seems to me the EU is the, probably the most shameable one. Um, and, and it seems from talking to Peter that, you know, that, that they are willing to be shamed and, and clearly they're wanting to work with Arua, so that's exciting. The American university libraries are rich than themselves. They are very powerful. So they are also a really important ally here. Um, I think... Um, the, you know, the, the points you raised, Kwame, about, about the deeper underlying issues, I totally agree. I mean, it was, thinking about Kwame Nkrumah, I was really shocked to hear that he was really struggling with publishing in independent Ghana, and he called in Macmillan publishers to help. And, you know, I, I think there's a way in which um, these, are, these, 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 these are deep histories here of colonial publishing relations in Africa, and we need to understand that and build on it. Um, uh, the other thing I would say is that, you know, 1960s, there was a view from Dar es Salaam. You know, the geographers in Dar es Salaam were building a view from their world. It was a view from Africa, and they were publishing in global journals a Dar perspective on the world. And, you know, again, that, that, that came out in that debate between Masri and um, um, Rodney. So, so, I, so I think there's lots to learn from the past. I think there's an exciting moment for change. I think um, Arua is super well placed to do all this. I'm, I'm really excited for, for, for you know, how Arua is going to go from strength to strength. That bird is endangered. Okay? Can we make it extinct? Let's see. Thank you very much for your questions.
Thank you very, very, very much, uh, David. Thank you very much. One of the things that you've done, which I don't like, is you are, you are making this, uh, you are making Aruba take responsibility for things. It was not intended to take responsibility for uh, the, the, the new board chair is here. So, Mr. Chairman, you think about it, and let's see whether you think Arua should be pursuing these new things or, or not. But I think it's a, 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 an important thing to, even if we don't do anything, we should discuss it and see how best we can influence. The one thing I would like to see more of in the future is a revival of university presses. Uh, in most of our universities, they've gone bankrupt, but we have not been able to support them. They, they used to be supported by uh, government budgets. Um, these days, governments are refusing to fund those kinds of things. So university leaders will have to think about other creative ways of making these uh, viable enterprises. So thank you very much. Uh, we've come to that. So that's the end of the uh, keynote sessions that uh, we had, five of them. They were being great. They will inform uh, what communication we put out there, and also the direct discussion that has taken place here. Very, very exciting, and I look forward to seeing you all this afternoon uh, for the policy roundtable that will close the, uh, for, just for your information, one person from the uh, roundtable has had to leave, and so I have an open slot. If anybody would like to join the policy roundtable this afternoon, Please see me after this, and then I'll be happy to uh, co-opt you onto the uh, policy roundtable. We will break now uh, for 20 minutes, um, and then resume. Okay. All right. Okay. 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 Imana wants us to have a, a group photograph outside uh, so that uh, there will be a record of uh, who was here and who was not. Um, I've had to, I, I, once again, we have to modify the schedule for this afternoon. Uh, you remember at the beginning of this session, I said that uh, there will be um, a 30 minute break from 4 to 4.30. The suggestion has been made that instead of having that break, we should continue right through, so that we'll be closing at 5.30, and then at 5.30 we close, and there will be uh, the refreshments. Uh, there will be, be refreshments at 5.30, and then those who want to go shopping can go shopping. <laughs> so I hope, I hope that's okay. One final announcement. Uh, the, the book by Max, uh, Max Price uh, on the uh, statues and storms. It's available at the back. It's going for, we have only eight copies remaining. Uh, it's going for $20. So please buy a copy, uh, especially if you are aspiring to become a vice chancellor. And uh, it, it will guide you on how to be a vice chancellor. So let's break it up. Okay, thank you. There's a change of venue for just this one. Okay. Um, just for your information, we have these uh, uh, sessions for the centers of excellence. Um, the first one, this one, they all be at 10.30. The first one is for um, unemployment and skills development, which takes place, where is it? So the first one, 5.1, is for unemployment. 5.2 is inequality. That to, that, that to be taking place here. Um, 5.3 takes place in the Faculty of Law Board, that's post-conflict. And then 5.4, that's sustainable food systems. That's what takes place in the Faculty of Engineering webinar room. Yeah, okay. So, Sustainable Food Systems Faculty of Engineering webinar room. And then the last one, Notions of Identity in the Faculty of Law room two. On the ground floor. On the ground floor, yeah. So, these are four this morning. 
And now there are also buses taking uh, delegates who have written their names uh, to the museum. And these will be available from now. Yeah, okay. So thank you very much, and I'll see you later. Please be back for the uh, policy roundtable at uh, uh, 4.30. Thank you.